right. So we're continuing our series in the Psalms. Uh, when I was a youth minister, uh, for, for those that don't know, I was a youth minister here many, many moons ago. And, uh, and then we, uh, we left after a while, went to New Zealand, and then we came back because... Because honestly, we came back because this really felt like um, we really felt like we were family here first and minister second, and so we wanted to come back to this church home. We wanted to raise our kids here, and uh, so we came back as members, and then eventually, you know, uh, got roped into getting on on staff and all that other stuff again. Um, yeah, they they were scraping the bottom of the barrel and needed somebody. So, uh, but uh, but when I was a youth minister here, there was a guy named Ben Marinas who was the preacher, right? Uh, and uh, uh, every Sunday he would get up and let's, let's see if you guys know it or not, because he would do it every Sunday. Let's see if the people, uh, have been there that long, but he would say, God is good all the time. All the time? Yeah. See, he would say, and, 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 uh, I would sit down with the youth group cause that's, uh, that's where we used to sit until the praise team came in and just took our spot. You praise team. Anyway, that was our spot. Right. And we would all just kind of look at each other and smile. You know, all the kids would just kind of look over at me and, and, and we'd kind of, you know, uh, laugh a little bit and stuff. But, um, but I, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. It was a great reminder, man, that no matter what's going on, God is good all the time, all the time. God is good. Um, but there are times in my life, I don't know about you, but this has happened to me. There are times in my life where that, that sometimes make me question the goodness of God. I do. I, I, don't, I don't want to. I don't, I, don't, I don't want to do that, but sometimes my faith is just not where it needs to be, and I, and I do lack faith uh, a lot of the time. One of my most common prayers is, Lord, I believe, help me in my unbelief. Uh, and, and sometimes I do question the goodness of God. And, and in the Psalms, what we see is, uh, we're, you know, Psalm 69, we see that David is at the end of his rope. Uh, Psalm 69, 1 through 3, he says this, and, and this is the way we normally read it. At least this is the way I read it. Um, Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. Now, the Hebrew word for waters is ha, 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 ha. And, uh, blow, you know, like I start, I start dissecting the passage and stuff like that. But what I want you to do is that wasn't actually the real Hebrew word for water, by the way. Anyway, that was just, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what it is, is like, I, I want you to, to really sense what's going on. He, he's saying this. He's saying, save me, oh God, for the waters are up to my neck. The waters are rising and they're up to my neck. I sink in the miry depths where there is no foothold. He can't get out. He's treading water. Have you been there? where you're just treading water in life. He's treading water, he has no foothold. I have come into the deep waters. The floods engulf me. I am worn out from calling for help. I am worn out, God. My throat is parched. My, and, and listen to this, my eyes fail looking for my God. Are, haven't there been situations in your life that have made you question? the goodness of God, where you just feel like you're just treading water, the, the things are overwhelming. It's like a domino effect that one thing happens and the whole thing topples down. It's a house of cards and you feel like, man, everything is going wrong. Everything that could go wrong is going wrong. I am, I am drowning, God, and I sit here and you've promised that you would answer me, but I call out day and night and not a word. Have you been there? Have you been there? I've been there. I've been there. I, I can't tell you the reaction that I had when, um, uh, when yesterday I heard the news of, you know, Israel being attacked. I went, God, haven't you had enough years to fix that already? What is going on? Why? Why another war? Why more death? God, what are you doing? Wake up. Wake up. That was my prayer. I mean, I've been there. It seems like, I don't know, at the first of my adult life, I was going to a lot of weddings and baby showers. But as I get older, it sure seems like I'm spending a lot more time in the hospitals and at funerals. When I was young, I believed that the story uh, that we lived was a happily ever after story. But, but the more that I see the world, I, I, while I thought we were living in a co comedy, it sure seems like a tragedy some days. 
And what I've found is no one in this world is immune to the downward spiral of disappointment. Nobody is immune from it. This is something that we all feel regardless of socioeconomic level, regardless of race, regardless of where we live. We all feel this. I think all of us know what it's like to be in over our heads. And some of the waves, the waves come at us in different ways. Some of the waves are external, you know, a situation that's just sort of landed upon us and it's beyond our control, you know. Uh, To quote the great philosopher Hank Williams Jr., you know, the interest is up and the stock market's down and you only get mugged when you go downtown, you know. I was like, yes, yeah. That's, I, live in, I live near Austin, and, and all of us in this room are like, I'm not going to Austin, you know, <laughs> like, you know, it's, uh, the interest is up and the stock market's down. I'm like, man, Hank Williams, he's a prophet, you know? Um, no, he's not really a prophet. Don't nobody come up to me afterwards and be like, ah, oh, so, you know, n- anyway, that was a joke. That was considered, anyway. Um, but some of the waves, like I said, are external. You got the war in Ukraine and you got the war in Israel. You have... Uh, the polarized political landscape, you know? I mean, everything just seems to be weighing us down. Even, even this, I found this, and this is, you're gonna be like, whatever, Paul, but this is serious. I, I was even mad and overwhelmed the other day because I went into Costco, and I think every person that walks at a snail's pace was in front of me. They would be like. And then they would just get out their phone randomly. Hello? Hello, I'm like, get out of the way, you know, like, uh, ah, it's just frustrating. Anyway, get frustrated. You know, whatever it is, though, what it does is, is it feels like death by a thousand cuts and you start to get overwhelmed. You start to feel these emotions grow inside of you. You're like, oh, you start to get angry. You start to feel hopeless. You start to feel overwhelmed. I mean, some of these waves are personal. You know, we have external waves, but we have personal waves, a situation that arises with someone that we love. Some of us in this room have family issues. We have parenting stress. A loved one gets sick and needs care. Your adult children are experiencing suffering. Your aging parents need need you to be a caregiver. These situations can seem overwhelming and you don't know what to do. And some of these waves can be internal. It's a state of mind that weighs us down. Some of these, some of these waves, I mean, it could be uh, because of sin in your life, willful disobedience. It could be from depression and anxiety due to chemical imbalances in the brain. It could be from trauma, whether past or present. It can be our feelings of inadequacy that begin to boil over. And this can lead us to feeling overwhelmed and helpless. And we start to cry out, you know, to, uh, I was thinking of uh, this quote from Jim Gaffigan, who's a comedian, uh, talking about having a uh, fourth child or something like that. He said, oh, yeah, it's, uh, it's like you're drowning and someone hands you a baby. And I was like, that's life right there. That's what life feels like sometimes is you're drowning and someone hands you a baby. But let's see. Let's see what uh, David does with all of this. In Psalm 40, one through three, he says this. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. Oh, this is a beautiful psalm of God's deliverance. Because in this psalm, again, we go back to David is stuck. His movements are limited. Have you ever felt like that? You know, that you keep running out of options? You know, darned if you do, darned if you don't. That kind of thing. Life feels like one step forward and two steps back. You know, I, I, I feel that. Every step he takes seems to be met with a roadblock. He's in a situation that he can't get out of. He needs help. And the question becomes, what do you do when you need help? What do you do? And I'll be real honest. I'm going to be gut level honest with you. This is what I do. I cry. I complain. I cuss. I fold my arms and stomp my feet. I get silent. I just sit there and I just stew. And I get really mad at everything. I'm annoyed at everything. I, I, I tell whoever will listen how hard my life is to get sympathy from everyone because I want everyone else to feel as miserable as I feel. 
I, I become short-tempered with my wife and my kids. I get angry at things like weather and inanimate objects. Stupid remote, why are you not working? Like that's going to help the remote, you know, and it's out of batteries and I'm just, you know, I go outside, stupid weather, it's so hot out here, I don't know what's going on. And then I had the audacity the other day to walk out when it was cool and going, I better not get too cold, I swear. I just, you know, like, like I just, it was, I'm just mad. I start to isolate myself from people. I run, I run and, and lay in bed and I watch Netflix. I blame others for my problems and I envy those that don't have my problems. I get bitter, I get sad, I get depressed, I get anxious, I get inactive, I get selfish. Can you relate to any of this? Am I the only one in the room that feels that? But that's what I do, I do. Because when life gets overwhelmed, I just, I just, want to freeze. I, I, you know, I, I fight, flee, or freeze, and I just freeze up, and I just don't know what to do, and I want somebody to come and rescue me. I want somebody to take that away, but here's what David did, and I love this. Here's what he encourages us to do. He says, when those times happen, you need to wait. He says, I waited patiently for the Lord. Another way of saying that in the Hebrew is I waited and 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 I waited for the Lord. Or still another way, I waited with hopeful anticipation for the Lord. And see, in our modern minds, waiting is basically inactivity. Waiting, we don't do anything. Waiting is like standing in line at Walmart when there's one checkout person and a hundred lines that are not open, but we all have to stand in line and wait for that one person. And we're like, that's what we think waiting is. But in the Hebrew mind, it's completely different. In the biblical mind, waiting involves activity and anticipation. Uh, let, me, let me give you an example. For Thanksgiving, uh, uh, our family is waiting patiently for Ryland to come back from college. We are waiting for Ryland. But what we do as we wait is we clean his room, we buy his favorite foods and snacks, we plan activities, we get air freshener because boys stink. You know, we do all this stuff, right? That's what we do. We, we, there, there's this like anticipation. And then when I look at Life 360 and I see that he's close, I stand outside in anticipation of his arrival. I look for him. I look for him. I'm out there looking and seeing if he's going to come in. And that's what we are called to do during difficult times. We prepare in hopeful anticipation for when God will deliver us. Not if he will deliver us. Do you see that? We wait for hopeful anticipation when he will deliver us because our God has shown time and time again that he is a God that will deliver. At just the right time, he will show up. He will remember. He will remember us. When you see the story of uh, Noah and the ark, the middle section, the main point that God wants us to know through that story, it says, and then God remembered Noah. Well, did, did God ever forget Noah? No, that's not what the word remember means. The word uh, biblically, uh, when, when God remembers, he acts. He comes down and he does something tangible in our world and in our life. Um, the middle of the story of Rachel, it says, and God remembered Rachel and, and opened up her womb. That's basically what it was saying. That's the main part of the story that God remembers. The actors in the story of Genesis, they're not the main actors, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Rachel, all those things. No, God is the main actor. God is the one who remembers and he acts. So we prepare in hopeful anticipation for when God will deliver us. Instead of looking for where God is not, we hopefully look for where he is. In difficult times, what we're supposed to be doing is, oh, I wonder, I wonder what God's going to do through this. Man, this seems really tough, but I wonder what God's going to do. Hmm, I wonder where God is in this. Or even, er, God, where are you in this? That's okay. But we're looking for where God is. You see, hope, hoping does not mean doing nothing. It means living our life in a way confident that God will provide the meaning and the conclusion. That God will provide the meaning and conclusion. Because we keep asking, why God? Why is this happening in my life? No, no, no. Trust God that he will provide the meaning and conclusion. And uh, what you will find is this. Faith means believing in advance 
what, we will, on, what will only make sense in reverse. Believing in advance what only will make sense in reverse. When you are in a pit, the only thing that you can do is look up. Look up. And a lot of us get stuck in that pit and we just want to sit there and ask questions. How did I, how did I get here? Why am I here? I want answers. And we are looking down the whole time and stuff. And God's sitting up there going, look up. Look up. See. As a, you know, see what's going on. Look up. And what you will find is this when you look up. You will find that God does not give us answers as much as he gives us himself. And ultimately, that's what we want. When we cry out, why, God? Why is this happening to me? Why, why, why? Even if you knew why, it wouldn't make the pain better. It wouldn't make the pain better. You know, I mean, I go in as a little kid for a shot and my parents even tell me why I'm getting a shot. Well, it's a vaccination against blah, 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 blah. It doesn't make me feel better. You know, even though I know why it's still I don't like a needle in my arm. But God doesn't give us answers as much as he gives us himself. What we realize is that pain in our lives is the invitation for God to enter. Pain is the invitation for God to enter. God is not on call like a repairman who shows up only when we need him. God is always with us in the muck, in the mire, and all of that. He is with us. God does not exempt us from suffering, but here's his promise. He will lead us through it. That's the promise that we hold on to. We are not exempt from suffering. Nobody in the world is exempt from suffering. Christians, non-Christians, whatever. But thank God that we have a God who will lead us through times of suffering. This is not so much, uh, um, this is so much more than just hoping for the best and preparing for the worst. This is trusting that though weeping may stay for the night, rejoicing comes with the morning. Um, I don't know if you've heard of this, uh, this new author. Uh, you know, I think he's going to, if he writes a couple more books, I think he's really going to make it. His name is Max Licato. Um, he says this, he says, um, sometimes God takes his time. 120 years to prepare Noah for the flood. 80 years to prepare Moses for his work. God called young David to be king, but returned him to the, uh, to the sheep pasture. He called Paul to be an apostle and then isolated him in Arabia for 14 years. How long will God take with you? His history is redeemed, not in minutes, but in lifetimes. We feel the depression will never lift. The yelling will never stop. The pain will never leave. Will this sky ever brighten? This load ever lighten? Life in the pit stinks. Yet for all the rottenness, doesn't it do this much? Doesn't it force us to look upward? The Bible promises at the right time in God's hands, intended evil becomes eventual good. You will get through this. You will get through this. And we see this time and time and time again, not only in scripture, but we know this from our life. The pain does not last. The night will eventually turn to day. And so in those times of pain and struggle, we wait. We wait. And as we wait, He also gives us something else that we do. Number two, we cry out. He turned to me and heard my cry, it says in the Psalms. In the pit, David humbly cried out to God. And I think this is a a tough thing. And when we talk about this in in the church, because many people that I've talked to think it's unspiritual to cry out to God. They think that their faith needs to be stoic and unaffected by difficult situations. They think that faith is not, is, is not saying, yeah, life is really tough right now because they feel like that's lack of faith. And I want to tell you that's the complete opposite. You know, we start to tell ourselves when, when things start to happen, either people tell us or we tell ourselves uh, things like, well, God is sovereign. His ways are higher than our ways. Well, yeah, I mean, that's true. 
Uh, this pit is according to his plan. Well, maybe. There are some things that happen in the world that are not according to what, I mean, that don't follow God's will, you know? Um, or we say, oh, God will work this out for the good. Well, hopefully in our lifetime, maybe. But here's the thing I want you to know. Last time I checked, we are still human. We are still human. That's like me hitting my finger with a hammer, if I ever used a hammer, but hitting my finger with a hammer saying, well, it's not going to kill me, so I'm okay. Well, yeah, but it still hurts. Like, it still hurts, and that's okay to hurt. We're human. We feel the pain when a kid scrapes his knee and runs into the arm of his parents. Is that showing lack of faith? No. No. Is a kid when he's hungry, you know, a little baby when they're hungry, starting to cry out? Is that showing lack of faith? Does that baby, do I just walk by that baby and say, oh, I know what it feels like to be hungry. Grow up, kid. No, that's what we expect a kid to do. That's showing trust, not defiance. That's showing trust that people will provide when we cry out, when we call out, when we scrape our knee and run to our parent. We have faith knowing that when we run to them, they're going to do something about it. That is faith. That is not defiance. And we as God's children are supposed to run into our father's arms. It's okay to cry out. It's okay to go, how long? How long, oh Lord, do we have to sit in this? What is going on in the world? Why? Every time I turn on the news, somebody else is at war. Why, God? It's okay to do that. It's okay to go, God, goodness, cancer, really? After all the things that I've been through, all the, haven't I served you, God? Haven't, haven't I given you my life? And then at the end, you're going to do this? Really? The pink slip? God, I've been so faithful to that organization. I've helped them out so much and, and you're gonna, I'm gonna get fired? You're gonna allow that to happen to me? And the list could go on, right? You know, the list could go on. And not only for our lives, but this, uh, usually the things in our lives we can handle. But this is, this is where things get out of line. Really, God, you're gonna allow that to happen to my kid? Oh, me and God have actually had a lot of talks about this. Because I can handle a lot, but if something happens to my children, we've, I've had to, had to really pray through that stuff. But God, are you serious? They're going through this hard time. Come on. Or you see people and, and, and that are just broken and beat down and it seems like they can't get right when they get up on their feet, they're swept off their feet again. And you're like, come on, God, is there no righteousness in the world? Do, uh, you know, do, what happened to the, you know, they're, they're good people. Why does it seem like the evil prosper all the time? God, and while the righteous suffer, do you, do you hear echoes of the Psalms? Because David had the same questions. And it's okay to ask those. It doesn't show lack of faith to cry out to God and say, what in the world is going on, God? I mean, that's what it is. There's a, there's a book in the, the Old Testament called um, Habakkuk. Uh, which uh, I'm sure you've all done book studies on and love, you know, and it's part of your daily Bible reading every day. Um, but basically, that's a whole lament. It's, it's uh, a, somebody going up before God and saying, God, what in the world is going on? You need to fix it. And God answers and says, blah, 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 blah. And then the guy's like, well, blah, blah. And he's like, blah, blah. And then blah, blah. And then blah, blah. And then the guy goes, blah, 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 blah. You're right. You're right. You know. But it's okay to cry out because that shows faith. That shows faith that we're crying out. So as we wait and as we cry out, number three, we pray boldly. Psalm 80 is a bold prayer to God. He says things like, awaken your might and come save us. Restore us, O God. Make your face shine on us that we may be saved. Return to us, God Almighty. Look down from heaven and see they're pretty bold prayers. I don't know if you need permission this morning, but it is okay to approach God with boldness. It is okay. That's not disrespectful to approach God with boldness. The curtain has been torn. There is nothing that stands between you and God right now. Isn't that beautiful? Because of Jesus Christ.
We don't have to wait once a year for a high priest to go into to offer sacrifices. We, you, and I, not just uh, preachers, not just whoever. You don't need people to go before you to God. You and I can go to God right now and pray the prayers that we need to pray because Hebrews 4.16 says this, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that he may receive, uh, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Psalm 80 is a prayer of revival for ourselves. It's a prayer of revival for God's people and it's a prayer of revival for the world. And the prayer that I want to pray this morning is, Lord, let revival begin with me. Lord, let revival begin with me. There are times, Lord, that my heart is hard and my faith has grown, grown cold. God, there are times that I don't see you. I look and only I see the winds and the waves and I get distracted and I start to cry out, Father, I just want to focus my eyes on you. Lord, allow, let revival begin with me. May this church be a church of revival. May the Holy Spirit sweep through this place and people catch the Spirit in such a way that we stand on our feet and we praise God and it gives us the comfort knowing that God is a God who will take care of things. God is a God of deliverance. God is a God who will answer our prayers. And Father, for the world, may revival be in our world. We are set on destroying one another. We are, con we are always trying to destroy one another. And one day, somebody's going to hit that button. And everybody's going to hit the button. Because I don't know what we have this fascination with death. This fascination with power and money and, and pride and all these other things. Nationalism and all these other things that, these other gods that take the place of who God really is. God, we need revival in this world. We need revival in our lives. We need revival in, in the churches. We need revival in this world. And what we're praying right now, God, is that you come down and answer our prayers. That you remember us, God. That you remember your people that you come down in mighty ways and do great things among us, Father. So this morning, we wait, we cry out, and we pray boldly. This morning, you may be in need of help. You may be in a situation where you're up to your neck, you're up to your eyeballs in just craziness that goes on in life. You're overwhelmed. Maybe it's in your own life or maybe it's in the lives of others. We have a prayer team and I'd like the prayer team to stand. And they're actually going to go back and stand by these pillars, these white pillars back here. Uh, so if the praise team could, or the, not the praise team, you guys stay right there. You still got a job to do. Uh, the uh, prayer team, if you guys could go back to the pillars. Um, they're there to pray with you. Um, sometimes our throat is parched. Sometimes we've cried out so much we can't cry anymore. There's no more tears to cry. Well, this prayer team, they will cry out with you and for you. They will pray bold prayers on your behalf. They will wait with you. We will wait with you. If there's a need, if you find yourself in that pit, look up and see that our help comes from the Lord. Let's pray. Revive us, God. We are so tired and weary. We, we need you, God. We need you to come down and we need revival in our hearts. We need you to set us ablaze, a, a God. We need you to light the fire in our hearts, Father. We need you to help our love for you burn and help us to look up. Father, we are so self-sufficient. We are people that have been taught from a very early age and it's the waters in which we swim that we just need to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. We are self-sufficient. We are independent people. And Father, may you break those idols in our heart because we are not independent of you. 
We are dependent on you, God. We are not self-sufficient. We don't have all the answers and we don't have it all together. There are some times that we can't pull ourselves up, up by our own bootstraps. There are some things that money can't get us out of. So, Father, we lay all that on the altar. We lay our money. We lay our positions. We, we lay our education. We lay our privilege. We lay all of that down before you. We give it to you, God, as an offering. And Father, we cling to the cross. We look up at you and give you our lives. Father, we not only need revival in our hearts, but we need revival in this church. Father, there are many people here today that need to hear a word from you. There are many people here today where their faith has grown cold. There are many people here today that, that need your help. Father, we pray for revival. We pray that this church can be a city on a hill. Father, we pray that, that uh, you... You give us the, the heart and the mindset to reach those and to help those that need help the most. Father, help us to see that what we do here is not about us, but it's about you, God. Help us to see that our time and our talent and our treasures don't belong to us, but they belong to you. Father, I know that it's not what you want from us, but it's, it's what you want for us, God. So may revival be set ablaze in this church. And finally, Lord, for our world. God, why do the nations rage? Why do they plot and scheme? Father, I pray that you eradicate evil in this world. You eradicate it in our hearts. You eradicate it in our, in our lives. You eradicate it in this world. Father, I, I pray that this morning that you're close to the brokenhearted that are experiencing the, the trials of war, that have lost loved ones. Father, we feel helpless in this situation because we can't, it's not like we can do anything, God, but I know that you are there and you are working. And because of that, we put our hope and trust in you. Father, some put their hope and trust in chariots and horses and military might and military wealth and all that stuff, Father. All of that is rubbish in comparison to your greatness and to who you are. We put our hope in you. Through the name of Jesus, amen.